Good morning, everyone. My name is Derek Teisinger. I'm a division chief with the Kern County Fire Department and part of this collaborative team effort. I'd like to thank our law enforcement agencies, Kern County Sheriff, uh, CHP, uh, to help with the evacuations. They're always a big part of this. In cooperation with us, we have the U.S. Forest Service, the Bureau of Land Management, Cal OES, Cal Fire, and a host of other agencies. We really thank our cooperators. It makes me really proud to be part of this team more and more every year. We have a special honor and privilege. We have Governor Gavin Newsom and some of his staff here today with us, Director Ward, as, as well as Cal Fire Chief Tyler. Uh, we have a, a great brief for you today with some updated incident information. And without further ado, I'd like to introduce our first speaker, Unified IC Battalion Chief of Kern County Fire, Jake Cagle. Good morning, everybody. Um, so I stand here in front of you. Uh, we're under unified command. Uh, we are managing three different fires. Uh, that is the Trout Fire, the Long Fire, as well as the Burrell Fire. Uh, we are unified command with United States Forest Service, Bureau of Land Management, and Kern County Fire Department representing CAL FIRE. Um, so in that addition, we have a lot of support, some cooperating agencies that are supporting us through this incident. And uh, that's the uh, California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, uh, the County of Kern, uh, County of Tulare, as well as the Kern County Sheriff's Department. And um, so, you know, this, the Burrell started it on the 24th and we saw multiple days of erratic and rapid fire spread. And uh, that was all under uh, red flag conditions, extreme temperatures, low relative humidity, strong gusty winds. So our firefighters were challenged out there. Uh, there was a very aggressive firefight. Uh, we went direct, that is the action the, that we like to take uh, to mitigate uh, the, the aggression that they did that really mitigated further uh, challenges and impacts to life safety, critical infrastructure and property. Uh, so I really appreciate all the hard work that everybody's done on this incident. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank the governor for your support, for being here, and your staff. Uh, as we are very busy in the state of California, it's still early, still early fire season. Uh, we have fires in Northern California, Southern California, as well as the Western United States. Uh, so we're challenged with resources, and that's one of the challenges we're faced with this incident, like other incidents. But we are doing our due diligence to ensure that we're getting around this fire and uh, taking care of this incident. Uh, also, our thoughts are with the Kern River Valley community. Uh, we are, we are, they're in our thoughts, and we're here. We will continue to be vigilant to get around this incident, to uh, not impact any more property, life safety, and critical infrastructure. Uh, thank you. Our next presenter is going to be Chief Tyler from Cal Fire. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Joe Tyler. I'm the director and fire chief at Cal Fire. It is an honor and a privilege to be able to come down and get a briefing from California Incident to California Complex Incident Management Team 11 in Unified Command with the Kern County Fire Department. And I too want to thank the efforts of all the women and men who are here on this fire today and have been for the last few days fighting this fire and making great progress across the landscape. Now, as was said earlier, there is significant fire activity occurring across California and across the Pacific Northwest. And some people might ask, are there sufficient resources in California? Well, we are one of the most complex fire service systems and mutual aid systems in the nation. As part of this mutual aid system, we have two geographic coordination areas that is unlike anywhere in the United States. We are broken up with two geographic coordination areas in the state. The folks that work in those locations in Redding and in Riverside are utilizing and dispersing resources across the 23 large fires and specifically the Burrell and the Park Fire that's occurring in Butte County. Likewise, resources are being dispatched across Oregon and Washington to meet the needs of all the large fires that are occurring. Now we I think I lost the volume. So uh, as, as those resources continue to pour in, we recognize the need to order additional resources. So working with our partners at Cal OES, 
We continue to reach out and ask for resources across the United States. And various states are bringing resources into us as well as aircraft. Those are being managed, volumes back on. Those are being managed across the, across the state to meet the needs of the incident management teams who are leading the charge to mitigate these incidents. It is great work that we're seeing here locally. And I wanna thank again everyone who has been here on the ground mitigating this incident and the others across California. It is now my honor to introduce the governor of the state of California, Gavin Newsom. Thanks, Chief. Thank you all. Uh, thank you all for being out here. Particularly, let me just thank the men and women in uniform, those behind me, those in front of me, those who are out there on the lines uh, working hard uh, to uh, address what has become very familiar in the state of California, summertime. Uh, the challenges of the hot's getting a lot hotter, the dry is getting a lot drier, the wet's getting a lot wetter, and all the impact that's having after years and years of drought and then two very, very wet rainy seasons, the early grass, the brush, uh, this was anticipated. This was exactly as we had imagined uh, early part of the summer to be. That said, we're seeing uh, multiples of challenges. Just to put it in perspective, right uh, today, right now, we're reflecting on the fact this fire season's already begun with over 4,600 fires to date, uh, burning over 750,000 acres. Put that in perspective, the last five years, the average has been about 4,400 fires uh, and about 140,000 acres burned, 140,000 to 750,000 that we are battling here today. I want to thank Supervisor Peters for being here. I want to thank representatives of Senator Grove uh, and her office for being here. I want to thank Chief Cagle uh, and his team uh, for all their hard work. I want to thank everyone for the collaborative spirit, the spirit of partnership uh, that has been a big part of the success, the early success of the containment, now 17% on this complex. As was noted, uh, the trout and the long uh, have substantially been tamed. Uh, Morel, uh, component of this, uh, we still have work to do, particularly on the east side. Uh, but the containment uh, at 17 percent is real progress. The progress, obviously, of Mother Nature uh, with these relatively calm winds. Uh, it's all relative out here. Mindful, those conditions can radically change. But one condition uh, that we maintain is vigilance. And the investment uh, that we've made, historic investment in personnel, the next level cooperation in terms of the mutual aid system, nothing else like it anywhere in the United States of America. The partnerships that are well established uh, as it relates to BLM, the U.S. Forest Service, the work that's being done at the county level, not just uh, with Kern County Fire Department, but the county sheriff's office and the great work uh, they're doing, the work that continues to be done in partnership with CAL FIRE uh, and the Office of Emergency Service. And I'll just note, as it relates to CAL FIRE, uh, when I got here as governor just six or so years ago, we had about 6,700 personnel at CAL FIRE. Today, over 9,700 men and women working at CAL FIRE. It's a record number, 365 engines, fully staffed. We have the finest and the largest civil aerial suppression fleet anywhere on planet Earth. That's in the possession of the people of the state of California, and we're doing everything we can to opera operationalize that. That said, the Park Fire up north where I was just 48 hours ago, uh, that's a fire uh, that now is the sixth largest in California history. And that fire is now over 384,000 acres uh, and growing. Uh, that fire has required a lot of mutual aid from outside of this state. And I would be wrong uh, if I did not acknowledge uh, our appreciation and respect for Governor Abbott in Texas. He just sent 25 engines uh, our way as part of our mutual aid system, sort of reinforcing the paradigm of partnership uh, at these critical moments. And so uh, to all those governors that have called, that have offered uh, support and equipment and personnel, to those that have received it, from us as early as just a few weeks ago up in Oregon where we had to recall some of the folks we brought over the border. It's just a reminder of the world we're living in and the new challenges that we face moving forward. So vigilance, preparedness, 
um, and uh, appropriate response uh, and mitigation. And that's the strategy, and that's the that's that's why we're out here, uh, just advancing not just on the strategy, uh, but but advancing uh, on an expression of gratitude uh, to everybody that's working 24/7. Uh, and has made so much progress here at this site uh, and to the people uh, that have been impacted. I just want to say this, you know, I've been at this for a while up in Greenville, California, Grizzly Flats, California. I started uh, with President Trump at the time up there uh, at Paradise. Uh, towns wiped off the map, places, lifestyles, traditions. Um, that's what this is really all about at the end of the day. It's about people. Uh, it's about history. It's about memories. Uh, and so I know how personal it is for folks, and that's why I'll be driving up uh, to an old gold mining community. I grew up in a town called Dutch Flat. Uh, I was literally born of the gold rush, not dissimilar to so many of the communities and towns around here. And so uh, we'll see that devastation firsthand, um, which is just remarkable uh, that we're seeing so many of these iconic places in California uh, that are being quite literally devastated by these new realities. So uh, again, respect and appreciation for everyone impacted. And in closing, in that spirit, uh, we just signed a few moments ago an emergency proclamation uh, that will make additional resources available. You've been seeing the hand crews out there uh, from our Conservation Corps. You've seen the work, the incredible work uh, that the National Guard does uh, across this state, and Swiss Army knife, uh, for all kinds of operations. Uh, this emergency proc will allow more National Guards men and women to help support your efforts, not just in the immediate, uh, but in the aftermath, uh, in the mopping, as we say, things up, uh, and getting people back on their feet. As it relates to unemployment insurance, uh, we'll be able to fast track uh, some of that access, as well as waiving any fees associated with getting support, all of those component parts of the emergency proclamation. Final words, I had an opportunity uh, to uh, connect with the White House, President Biden, uh, who has been immediate in his responses. Uh, he said in a voicemail I just got, he said the answer is yes, um, and I haven't even asked the question. And so I just want to also thank the White House for their support. Uh, that's unsurprising. Uh, that's the spirit, again, the partnership that defines this moment in so many moments as it relates to similar challenges that we've been faced. I'll close, final, final words. Uh, this is the beginning of the season, and I may have, frankly, overstated uh, what we had anticipated late June and July. Uh, as I noted by the acres, 750,000 versus 140,000, which is the five-year average. Uh, this, I won't say this is an exponential, but we're seeing significantly more intense activity. And so I, I pray that people are mindful of these evacuation orders. They take them seriously. You can replace a home. Uh, you can't replace a life. I mean, this is a sober and serious thing. Listen to the pros. Listen to the sheriff. Listen to local law enforcement. Your own instincts and your own experience, lived experience, of how quickly these things move and how devastating these wildfires are. There's nothing more devastating than learning about someone who's out there with their hose thinking they could pull uh, back when there's 70, 80 mile an hour winds and spotting everywhere and breaks your heart. And so I encourage everyone uh, to take advantage uh, of being prepared this wildfire season. You can always go to our fire.ca.gov site to learn about operational and situational awareness, uh, but also we have prevail. We have all kinds of resources at Cal OES in order to make you fire safe and fire ready and to prepare you uh, for the rest of a fire season that, with respect, may not even be a season any longer. Remember, Camp Fire was in November. It's not just August and September and October, but likely November, December, that we'll be fighting uh, the ferocity of Mother Nature uh, and these fires. So, again, Gratitude to everybody here assembled. Appreciation and respect uh, for all the work that you've done and the hard work that you have in front of you. Uh, and with that, we're all here to answer any questions. Hello, Governor. Thank you for coming in. Uh, the first question you touched on a little bit as it goes to unemployment, uh, insurance, excuse me, un un unemployment insurance and things of that nature. What do grants look like from your office to the folks that are affected by this directly? Yeah, we haven't been able, we're trying to get to that point as it relates to the threshold 
that is required to get the federal grants as individual assistance grants. As it relates to the specifics of the proclamation, it waives that one week period where you have to wait for unemployment insurance and fast tracks that. There's a series of other specific action items uh, as it relates to procurement and contracting and overtime and personnel uh, that I referenced. Uh, our team can lay that out in detail as it relates to the proclamation. But we are assessing the damage. I'll be personally doing that uh, in the 45 minute drive right after this to see the number of structures that have been damaged. There's a lot of different numbers out there as it relates to the number of buildings and structures. Once that determination is made, it will allow me to go back directly to the President and the White House uh, to seek the federal uh, support which would avail uh, that direct relief. Just a quick follow-up to that. I know that with, uh, as we said, we're already in July, we're only in July, I should say, only. And, the, and the season will continue to last longer. Um, what do you, do you think there will be enough availability if more fires continue to ravage through Kern County? We've seen around a thousand so far. Well, we look, uh, I, I was asking the chief a moment ago, it, it, nothing distills a sense of well-being more than coming to a situation like this and seeing local fire departments uh, and to see these trucks from all over the damn state, uh, for that matter, around the country, and we've seen in the past around the world. You know, one few years ago that I was there, the Office of Emergency Service in Sacramento, and a team came from Israel, uh, folks from uh, Australia. Uh, remember talking to uh, Justin Trudeau up in Canada, they sent down personnel as well. So people quite literally from around the world. So your question's a sobering one based upon how stretched we've been. Traditionally, we wouldn't have been so stressed if it was California specific, but a lot of that mutual aid was being stretched to west-wide fires, which have become more and more the norm. And so that's why these partnerships are so important. But look, uh, we put, we, we didn't cut the budget you know, I know there have been a lot of conversations about state budget. It was balanced, but not on your backs. $2.6 billion, still unprecedented, historic, next level unprecedented, historic investments in LIDAR and AI technology and drone technology and Black Hawk helicopters that now have night vision, the C-130s that we said we're not going to wait for the Pentagon anymore. Grateful they provided satellite access and technology, but we're not, we weren't happy with how slow the C-130s were in terms of getting that CAL FIRE flag. So we took all seven of them ourselves. The first one uh, we are, is being retrofitted in real time. All seven will be operationalized uh, in a number of months, it's a little over a year. Uh, we're working our tail off to get that done. So we're doing everything we possibly can. And as I noted, uh, we haven't skimped on staffing, at least in terms of CAL FIRE's effort. 9,700 is a record number of personnel. Uh, Chief Taylor has. And again, to Chief Taylor, just thank you as well. He's been all over the damn state in the last few days, and his state of mind is vigilance uh, and very mindful of the importance of, of, of getting more personnel from all over the country. And again, I'll just I'll end because I think it's important. You know, the reason I make a call to Greg Abbott to thank him is because I may need to make another one. First of all, it's out of respect and gratitude, grace, and humility but it's also mindful that we may need more support. Uh, and to get, you know, I got a call from governors out there in the East Coast that are willing to send personnel, and that's a hell of a thing. Uh, so uh, we are well-resourced. Uh, it's just a timeliness issue uh, that is the challenge. Hi, Governor, thank you so much for your time. I wanna talk about night operations a bit more. A couple days ago, we were told that crews would be stepping up um, efforts to fight the fire night and day. Um, I just want to ask what the resources at nighttime look like and how that's contributed to containing I've the got, fire. We've got our situational yeah. experts here. Who wants <laughs> Whoever to is that? the best to answer the question. Uh, thank you for the question. So yes, uh, we do staff a night shift uh, resources. It was instrumental in this incident, uh, specifically uh, to the uh, towns of Bodfish and Lake Isabella proper. So uh, crews, rolling stock, which is engines and dozers, all working through the night. But in addition to that, uh, aircraft uh, support, it's called QRF, uh, quick response force, uh, having night vision capability. So we were able to keep aircraft on the incident all night, which made significant difference uh, uh, and, and part of our success of locking off the piece that minimized the impact over into Bodfish as well as Lake Isabella. And one thing uh, we saw up in, at the Park Fire is that was 24 hour operations. Again, weather conditions, conditions more broadly defined, uh, being foundational. Uh, but 
to see the night the Nighthawk, those infrared goggles, these guys just doing 24 seven suppression. That's part of the investments we've made in the last few years that make that, uh, that technology available, which is uh, profoundly important. Anyone else? And there's no no change. It's been consistent from day one. Uh, there's just, you know, I, I say it all the time. We we have an open hand, not a closed fist, when it comes to emergency management, emergency preparedness. I made that point when I was working with President Trump. I don't know if there was a Democrat in America who was working more collaboratively on issues related to emergency preparedness and planning and management uh, than than California uh, and the White House, uh, despite <laughs> all the back and forth. Uh, that was going on uh, when it comes to people and uh, when it comes to protecting uh, a, a, and preserving um, we're all in this together and we say you know many parts one body and uh, and so and we're, we're all in this together and uh, I just I have no interest I don't even that dynamic of politics when it comes to emergency preparedness and planning means nothing to me and Greg Abbott uh, I got to say means a lot to us because he's been there consistently over the last few years but we've also uh, mindful just this year we sent aircraft uh, his way, we've been, we've been very quietly supporting his efforts as well as it should be always. Could you uh, elaborate just a bit on the proclamation you saw? Is it, that you signed? Is there a dollar figure? And how's that process go? Yeah, it's it's. Look, it, this is separate from a FEMA application for a federal FMAC or what we refer to these individual assistance. You have to reach a threshold in order to get there. So we're assessing that in real time. So I separate an emergency proc which allows for all these state resources. It's not money, it's avail it's state-backed support that will expedite and waive fees and processes, delays, uh, and provide more personnel, uh, which is all resourced back, but it's more about resourcefulness, resourcefulness and flexibility, time uh, to delivery. Uh, but again, that deeper assessment is being made. We go through a very detailed process. It can be stubborn very frustrating people don't understand uh, while their community may be devastated it doesn't hit a dollar threshold that's established as a federal uh, uh, line uh, we're constantly working uh, the margins with FEMA to convince them uh, it's not just about a dollar figure it's about the impact the totality impact has on a community that's been wiped off the map and so we'll be making those points uh, but I need to also make those points having visually seen that site and we'll be going up there assessing uh, in just a few moments anybody else well thank you again everybody just uh, hats off and you know when you see a guy or a gal in uniform, give them a damn hug. Thank you guys very much.